Well, good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to see all of your smiling faces so early um, this morning. And the first question we're going to address right away is you're probably wondering, well, they're not Mrs. White. They're not the superintendent. <laughs> Who are these folks sitting up here? So we want to address that right away and say to you that Mrs. White, unfortunately, wasn't able to be here this morning, but you need to know, and she wanted us to make sure you understood that the only thing that would pull her away from spending time with children are, is her family. And she has a situation in her family that she has to work through today, um, but she wanted to make sure that you knew that her heart was with you, her mind is with you, and that she will see you in your schools, in your classrooms, as she continues to visit schools for the rest of this year. So with that, we want to introduce ourselves to you, and she asked the three of us to stand in her place and answer your questions and get your feedback, because there's nothing more important to our superintendent than your voice. Um, so she wanted to make sure that we were here to hear your questions, to engage in a dialogue with you. So with that being said, my name is George Roberts. I serve as a community superintendent for the East Zone schools. So I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves and we'll go from there. Good morning. I'm Christina Byers and I'm the community superintendent for the Central Zone. Glad to be here with you this morning. Good morning. My name is Raquel Jones and I'm the community superintendent for the West Zone and I'm very happy to be here with you all. So before we engage in the questions um, and the comments you have for us in our dialogue with you this morning, the superintendent wanted us to share with you her two priorities. And if you spend any time with our superintendent over the past two years, you understand that these two items really are on the top of her list and consistently talking about and stressing with adults, with parents, with all stakeholders, but most importantly with you as students. First is literacy. Um, the superintendent is a teacher at heart. She was a teacher. She still is a teacher. So literacy is her foundation. And what do we mean by literacy? Literacy is at the most basic is reading and writing. Are we able to, when you graduate high school, as high schoolers, when you graduate, are you able to not just read and write, but are you able to read complex texts? Are you able to take in all the information? Each of you, had, before we started, I saw almost all of you had cell phones, and you were somewhere on that cell phone. So how do you process that information from all the sources? You guys are bombarded every single day, every minute with information, not just from social media sites, but from news sites, from everywhere, global information. How do you process that? How do you make intelligent decisions about the information that you receive? How do you receive, how do you deal with and process the information you receive in your classrooms from your teachers? That's literacy. The ability for you not just to read it, to write it, but how do you also communicate it? You asking questions today is a sign of literacy. You being able to communicate that in a speech, to stand up and articulate a question, or to provide a speech in a classroom, that's literacy. So when we look at that ability when you graduate and when all of you graduate, the superintendent also stresses, what else are you graduating with? She calls that the gift with purchase. So it's not just the diploma, which she says is really our obligation to you. Our obligation to you is that you walk across that stage with a diploma. But what she has raised that bar higher to is to say, what else do you have behind that diploma? Imagine the legs under a chair. What's supporting that diploma? For some of you, it may be a CTE completer. For some of you, it might be dual language certification. For some of you, it might be AP capstone certification. For some of you, it might be culinary arts. It might be construction trades. It could be any number of courses and opportunities that we offer in Baltimore County Public Schools that make that diploma something a little bit more, that gift with purchase. And that's gonna propel you into the next phase of your life when you graduate from Baltimore County Public Schools. But none of that matters unless we do that and we provide a climate in your building that's conducive to that. And that leads to her second point and what she wanted us to stress with you today was climate. So if we have the literacy work in your education and we're providing you that gift with purchase and you're taking advantage of all the things that Baltimore County Public Schools has to offer, do you feel safe when you come into your schools every day? What's it feel like in your schools? Do you feel welcomed? Do you feel like this is where I wanna be, that the people in this building care about me? Do you have that one adult who you can go to? When you walk into your schools every day, is there that one person, hopefully more, that you could go to, to ask a question, 
or maybe something happened in the morning, or maybe something happened last night in your home or in the neighborhood, is there that person you can go to and have that conversation with in a non-threatening way? Just someone who to listen. Maybe you're not looking for advice, but you're just looking for someone to listen and to connect with for that particular day to get you through that day and to help you move forward. That's climate. And that is something that she wants to ensure in all 174 of our schools for 114,000 students that all of you feel the same way. So that's her expectation, that's her wish for you, and that's her expectation of us. So around this room and around you this morning are the adults that are charged with not just providing you the education, but making sure that the environment, that the climate that you learn, work, and play in, in our schools and all the extracurriculars that you do, is done in a way that makes you feel supported and helps you mature and grow into the young adults that you are. So before we open up the floor to questions, I want to take an opportunity to our left and your right are all the teachers and staff that brought you here, not just brought you here, but these are the folks that do support you, that do create that climate. So if you join me, give them a round of applause real quick and thank them for coming in. And lastly, also in the room are members of the superintendent's cabinet because the superintendent wants to make sure that it's not just the community superintendents who are hearing your questions and hearing your voice, that it's her team. So the superintendent's cabinet is the superintendent's team, and she wants to make sure that they hear your questions, not just to problem solve, but that they can plan and be proactive in the work that they do in supporting you every single day. So it's important for all of us to understand that you are literally encircled by adults that are here to support you, and for today, to listen to you and hear your questions. So with that, we will alternate to make sure, if we, as best we can, if we can make sure we try to get at least one question from every school, um, and then one of the three of us um, will field that question for you. If there's any follow-up, we'll certainly stay behind, or we can follow up with you at your schools later on, or the team around us can follow up with you. So with that being said, we'll open it up the floor to our, to our mic persons um, for any questions, and we'll, we can start. Any questions? First question. Let's be that first one to break the ice. Right, there's someone right here in the black shirt, yep, and she's coming down with the mic. Noah Rittenberry, senior at Overly High School. Wonderful. As of our last meeting, we discussed the issues we faced at Overly High School, which included water damage, ceilings, active mold, and many other safety hazards. Upon writing to Superintendent Ms. Verletta White, Comptroller Francho, and Governor Hogan, the only person we did not receive a response from is Superintendent Mrs. Verletta White. My question is why? Okay, so climate, Facilities is a critical importance to the superintendent. Part of that responsibility is making sure that you learn in a very safe, clean environment. So to the questions that were addressed to Mrs. White, what we can do again in supporting those specific questions, we can address those afterwards, and specifically for, Over for Overly High School and Mrs. Sample, and we can work with Mrs. Sample on addressing specific issues to Overly High School. But understand that there's no pressing there's no issue greater to our school system than ensuring that you learn and work in an environment that is conducive to your learning. So with that, our, t our facilities team, we have environmental teams that work with principals and work with schools that when issues are raised to them to make sure that issues are addressed right away. Certainly our partners in county government, our partners in state government, you mentioned a couple of those in your question, are partners with us in addressing those questions. So when we talk about the issues you raised in your school or in any of your schools when it comes to the learning environment, we have a dedicated staff that goes in, looks at those issues, addresses those issues, and works with the county and state partners to make sure that all of you are in an environment that is conducive to your learning and make sure that you're able to do the work that you're expected to do um, on a daily basis. So again, we can touch base afterwards. That was a very good question. Thank you. Second question. Any other questions? Anyone from this side? No? All right. Young lady on the right. Tania Wilkes, Parkville High School freshman. Good morning, Tania. Good morning. My question is, how do you feel about all the snow days making us out and how people are responding to it? Uh, how, we, how do we feel about the snow days making us out and how people are responding to it? Well, again, that's safety. Um, so safety above all else is, is what's paramount. 
So when snow happens, that's a very, very hard decision um, that the superintendent makes when we get into the winter months. And those of you who grew up, and, and all of us who grew up in this area know that it could, we could go to bed and nothing's happening, and then we wake up overnight and there's two inches on the ground, or there's ice on the ground. So understand that all of us, and many of us in the school system have children, like yourselves, in the school system. So when snow days are built into our calendar, okay, so we know going into every school year that we have a certain number of snow days that are built into the calendar. So on those days where we wake up or with, we work with partners in weather forecasting to determine that we might have bad weather the next day, well, the superintendent takes in all that information. And as you've probably noticed over the past couple of years, sometimes we'll make decisions the day before. So you may be watching the news and a lot of you are shaking your heads. We'll say because of the safety issues and road conditions, we might go into two hour delay or we might close schools. Or sometimes when that snow falls at three in the morning and four in the morning, then that's where we have crews, again, back to our facilities teams and your question earlier, are out on the roads at three and four in the morning assessing the roads and then making recommendations as to is it safe to open schools. So we build in those times in our calendar if we go over, then again, because we're required, um, all counties are required in Maryland to have a certain number of days and hours for high school, for secondary kids, then we have to make sure that if we go over those snow days, that we make up that time um, at another point in the school year. So it's kind of this, this kind of chess game we play every year to determine, well, based on the snow days over the past two or three years, how many do we want to build in? That's presented to the Board of Education and we settle on a calendar for the following year. But safety's first. So if the roads aren't safe and schools aren't safe to be open, then certainly that decision is made to close schools or delay them. Okay, another question. Okay, here we go. Someone had to crack the ice on this side of the room. Um, Michaela Falcon. Perry Hall High School, I'm a Wonderful sophomore. Um, there's been talk of adding more time to next year's sort of end date. I was wondering if you could clarify, like what time we'll be getting out next year. <laughs> right, 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 so the end time, so this year, as you know, um, there were, and there was some confusion around the five minutes, you might have heard we added five minutes to the school day, and you were, so in, in reality, that was actually in working with our teachers, um, that was, part of their negotiated contract is a certain amount of time they come to school before first period and a certain amount of time after school. So that extra five minutes that most people thought well, was extra five minutes was really a negotiation of the teacher time between coming in and staying after. So knowing in the budget there was conversation around adding actual 15 minutes of time. The county executive released his budget. I would need to go back and we would need to go back and we can certainly follow up with you at Perry Hall High School around if, if the um, inclusion of that into the county executive's budget because there's money tied to that because we want to make sure our teachers and our staff are compensated for their time. So adding that 15 minutes of time, which would actually be adding 15 minutes of time because in Baltimore County, we have the shortest school day. You may not feel that way when you leave school on any given time, but in Baltimore County, we have one of the shortest school days of all of the counties in Baltimore City in the state of Maryland. So in order to add that time, we need to make sure that the financial resources are there to add that time, but also make sure that when we add that time, that again, we're compensating our employees appropriately in order that when we add that time, or when that time and if that time is added to the school day, then to make sure, to your question, where is that time added? Do we start school earlier? Do we start school later? And that's a conversation that we work with our transportation department, that we work with community stakeholders around, and to really make sure that schools are consistently, high schools for example, where's that time added? How much longer might your first period be, your second period be, um, or how much longer would your school day be? But also for middle schools, if any of you have siblings in middle school and elementary school, how might that impact them as well? Um, so there's a lot of considerations to if and when that time is added, how is that time added, and where is it added, looking K to 12, because some of you, pick up your little brothers or sisters or cousins at the bus stop, um, or you play athletics, or you, you have sports or clubs. So we really have to look at that holistically to make sure that if and when that's implemented, to make sure it's done in a responsible way. Okay, but great question, right? All right, since we took two from this one first, we're gonna take this gentleman in the white shirt here, and then we'll kind of start going back and forth. Um, speaking of time and allocation, Baltimore County Schools starts 
fairly earlier than a lot of counties, and why would that be? A lot of schools would start at like 8, 8.40. Um, our school day starts at 7.45. That's considerably earlier than what other counties do. Is there a reason to that? And is there a possibility of that time being pushed back um, following the addition of like the 15 minutes and all that? Before you sit down, can you tell us your name and where you're from? <laughs> tell it. You can say it. We'll say it for you. My name is Ayuk Rafa, and I go to Lock Raven High School. Lock I'm a senior. Okay. So, great question. And um, the superintendent actually convened a task force to look at your school day. And part of that task force did involve your start time. So, the extra 15 minutes that you inquired about was part of that task force so that we could extend our school day. Um, but they're also looking at start times. So many of you may know, you as high school students do start the earliest and then our schools are tiered. So high schools start the earliest, then middle schools, and actually our elementary students have the latest start times. So this group of individuals is looking at that um, to determine whether or not there would be any benefits to adjusting your start times. But there are a lot of things you have to consider with that. Uh, after school clubs, athletics, um, other things that you're involved in, uh, the way you, as Mr. Roberts said, sometimes are responsible for your younger siblings or relatives. And so they're looking at all of those factors to determine whether or not there would be benefits to adjusting some of your start times. And um, adjusting them in a way where you would start a little bit later. So. There's some work being done around that, but thank you for your question. It's a great question. All right, gentleman in the second row here, striped shirt. I'm George Moore from Dundalk, Good senior. Morning, George. My question is, why are we using the computers? The computers are like, mm -hmm. you're basically reading and writing. Mm -hmm. You want us to read and write more, mm -hmm. but we're on the computers most of the time. Why is that? Okay. So, so there's a lot of ways to approach right. that. There's a lot of ways to certainly approach an answer to that question. We open with literacy, okay, and that ability to read and write, you mentioned that in your question, that ability to filter information. First, technology is part of our daily lives. As I mentioned earlier, almost all of you have some type of technology, if not here on your person, at home, you have access to it in other areas. So technology is part of our daily lives. So part of our responsibility as educators is to teach you responsible use of technology. So is the device, and I, and I might have, and please tell me if I'm misunderstanding your question, if, if I'm, what I'm hearing in your question is, well, why do we use, um, if we're reading and writing, why don't we be writing with a pencil on a piece of paper? Yes, the answer is yes, you should be writing on a piece of paper with pen and pencil. But you also should be typing and accessing information digitally. So it's not a, an or, should we be doing this or doing this? It really is an and conversation because our responsibility in making you literate 21st century citizens, which is really at the core of what we do as educators, is to provide you not just with the tools of a 21st century education, but teach you how to use those tools. So what we do and our offices do is support your school, support your principals and your teachers, as well as the rest of the school system, our colleagues in curriculum and instruction, our colleagues in other departments and divisions within the system, is to provide you not just with the materials, but teach you how to use those in a responsible way. So really a short answer would be, it's and. So the devices and the computers are there, so you not just learn how to use them physically, but then when you're thinking about how to solve a problem, sometimes you just want a piece of paper. And some of you, and we all think differently, sometimes it's just jotting down notes and brainstorming notes. Okay, I'm just gonna brainstorm notes, or I'm gonna draw a picture on a big piece of chart paper because I think in pictures and I wanna see things in pictures. So because we all learn in different ways, we wanna provide you all with the tools that allow you to learn your best in the different ways that you learn. And for some of you, that might be a computer or somewhere down the road, you may go, well, I'm a, I like paper, but you know, yeah, I really need a, a computer because I need to get information this way. Right. So that's a great question, though. That's one we get quite often, so thank you for asking it. All right. In the back, in the white polo in the back, 
Kai Davis. I go to Sparrow's Point High School. I'm a freshman. Um, Sparrow's Point. All right. Going Welcome. off of what he said um, about the about the devices. Mm -hmm. So basically, like yeah, we can use the devices for taking a test. But what if like the devices don't work and the teachers never make a printed copy for it? Mm -hmm. So there's basically no use of using the device if we could do it on a piece of paper still. Going off of what he said. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So it's technology, and sometimes it's not going to work. Um, we always want you to have alternative methods for learning. So in, in a situation where your device is not working, um, we do want you to have an alternative way of either accessing the information that you need to learn or being able to demonstrate what you have learned through a different modality. Um, as Mr. Roberts said, we want you to know both and we want you exposed to both. In the event that something isn't working the way you need it to work, um, we want to make sure that you understand the avenues that you have in order to have that addressed. And so working with your teachers, there are ways to, if, some, if it's your individual device that's the problem in that moment, there are ways for that to be addressed at the school level. Um, sometimes we do, however, have system-wide connectivity problems. And so again, it's important that when things like that occur, when it's not something that's specific to your individual device, that we are prepared and planned for you to have alternative ways to access learning and then to demonstrate your learning. Thank you, though. Great question. All right, let's go to the back there. The gentleman in the suit and tie. <laughs> Always like a suit in a suit and tie. <laughs> Stand up, your name in school. Hello, my name is Bill Zhao. I'm from uh, Towson High School. Bill, welcome. My question is, uh, are there any plans to increase transparency in the procurement mm -hmm. system for BCPS? For example, the laptops. Um, I heard the laptops cost around $1,300, yet I cannot find any information as to what goes into that. Why th does it cost so much? All right. So transparency is a cornerstone for our superintendent and for Baltimore County Public Schools. Understand that for, and we want to share with you, over the past at least 10 years, Baltimore County Public Schools has undergone at least an audit some form of an audit in procurement processes and purchasing processes and we've won awards every year national awards and recognition for our procurement processes coupled with that transparency so to really go to your question our budget and the budget that the superintendent proposes to the board of education is published everything that's in the budget is produced Copies are provided in hard copy, kind of related to your question, but also electronically and posted on the website to this time. When you are heading back home and you want to see the budget, see how much devices cost, see how much money is allocated to not just devices, but also to student support, support money that's allocated to all areas of the school system, then you can go on to that, you can go onto your phones, you can go back to your schools, and you can pull that information up. So there is nothing that's not provided to our Board of Education, to the community around our budget process. It's there, it's visible, it's for everyone to view. So again, transparency, our budget processes, everything has, as we've gone through these past 10 to 15 years, our finance department and our budget office, again, recognize nationally and locally for the work that they do around crafting a budget, crafting a budget that's responsible, crafting a budget that's transparent, and one that's for view to the entire community. So we certainly welcome that, it's a great question, and we certainly welcome that, and I would ask you, as you go back, to view the budget, um, and to look at that. If you have questions beyond that, then certainly, if you said Towson High School, wonderful, then Mrs. Hey. Byers can certainly follow <laughs> up with you, and we can, you can dig in a little bit more on that, that's a great question. Great question. Okay. All right, over here, young lady right here. My name is Michaela, and I'm a freshman at the Crossroads Center. Okay. My question is, what is the school system doing about large class sizes where it is becoming difficult to learn? Okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Thank you for your question, Michaela. We are actually um, looking at staffing and class sizes as we speak to be able to address some of the, um, some of the concerns regarding our larger class sizes. And so we, as community superintendents, work very closely with our executive directors to have staffing conversations and conversations around class sizes to be able to talk about all of the um, all of the needs of particular students whether it's in your school crossroads or other schools to be able to say what are the needs of the students 
and then how can we meet those needs in the most feasible way possible. And so we look at staffing in the conversation of class sizes. We also take in what the subject area is, how many students have requested to be in that class, and that sometimes becomes um, a, bit of a, a bit of an issue because we have several classes or several um, electives or um, the core classes that students need at a particular time, and we wanna make sure that we're offering those classes to as most students as possible, and that sometimes does increase class size. But we're constantly having conversations with our principals and in our schools around what makes sense in terms of, in terms of class sizes. We also have some guidelines around class sizes, and so when class sizes are getting too big, we then have conversations with our human resources department to be able to think about how we can staff those classes more appropriately. But that's always at the center of our conversation. How are we making sure that our class sizes are conducive to learning for all of our students? Great question. Okay, back over here, we'll kind of come back up to the front here, this gentleman in the blue shirt, and then we'll work our way back. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I start, I just wanna thank you and Mr. Was White, uh, his cabinet for the work you guys do. Thank you. I know it takes a lot, and thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Earlier this year when there were uh, talks about the 2019-2020 operating budget, operating budget, there was a lot of cuts and allocations to different stuff. But what I felt was missing and w was not like talked about a lot was safety. Uh, at a, I'm gonna use my school for example. We have like 1,500 plus students and only two uh, police officers mm -hmm. to secure the safety students entering and leaving at any time, and it takes a lot, and it's a lot of work for our administration. If Mrs. White is confirmed in the summer as the permanent uh, superintendent, uh, I wanna know what is she gonna do mm -hmm. to address this issue, and if her voice is gonna be heard at the- uh, Absolutely. But yeah, yeah so let's tackle that in kind of two parts. That's yeah. a great question. One, I'll address one part of it, and Dr. Jones can address um, the people supports in terms of what Mrs. White has built into the budget, what she prioritizes in her budget in terms of supports from a people perspective and school social workers and psychologists. So Dr. Jones can address that portion because that's a critical, critical question when it comes to school safety. First, we have a national model, because you mentioned SROs, police officers in our buildings. We have a model that is recognized on a national level, meaning other districts come to Baltimore County, excuse me, to find out how have we partnered so strongly and so well with our police department. We are so fortunate to have our partners in the Baltimore County Police Department who under last year have increased their commitment to school safety by now having high schools with two SROs, um, again, looking at the sizes of the schools, all secondary middle schools have an SRO, and with the additional elementary schools, every precinct has a community officer whose sole duty is to work with elementary partners around driving to elementary schools, not just to ensure safety, but to teach, to talk to our young ones, to talk to our six-year-olds and seven-year-olds about general safety practices and to build that partnership. So that's part of the physical security. Also, in the budget and what was included in the county executive's budget was increased funding for cameras, so that physical security in the building, again, so when you walk in feeling safe, physically safe, redesigns of our new schools, retrofitting some of our other schools, again, around making sure that when visitors come in, there's a process for them to be checked in. The superintendent created a whole new division of school safety and climate. Dr. Martin Knox is in the back, who, who is the chief of that department. Um, and, and her department, her division, actually, her division is charged with in a very large way to work with the Baltimore County Police to go to the heart of what you're asking for about safety within our schools. But the other part of her division, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Jones, is really how are we proactive in supporting the kids and the human beings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you for your question. Um, to add on to some of the work that the Office of School Climate and Safety kind of handles um, at the school level, each school also has a, um, a safety manager, and a safety managers are assigned to the various schools, and they work behind the scenes in very close connection with the SROs. Even further, the schools have the counselors, the PPWs, the social workers, the psychologists, and the supports to really think about 
So what are some of the needs behind some of the safety issues that are occurring? So yes, we handle safety issues, but we also try to get to the root cause or the genesis of why these issues are occurring in our schools. And together we try to provide wraparound services. So again, we, Ms. White, as you asked about in terms of the budget, we've asked for her, the budget's been around um, people for our people and really thinking about how can we increase those services that are more proactive in handling safety issues. So that by the time issues get to SROs or to the school level, we're kind of addressing them in a reactive way. The budget allows for proactive measures in conjunction with the Office of School Climate and Safety to really think about on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, how are we working with you all as students to really get to the core of what some of the issues are to have less issues occurring. And we do that, like I said, through our PPWs who serve as liaisons between the school and the home. We do that with counselors. Um, this year we were able to, um, through Ms. White's vision, be able to be able to put into place our um, CTE counselors or our counselors who are focusing on car um, career and college readiness to be able to support those needs. We know you all are thinking about kind of next steps and sometimes that can be stressful. So we're handling things in, in an SRO fashion, which is somewhat reactive, but behind the scenes, we're also taking proactive measures through supports through our Division of School Safety and Climate. Good topic there. Thank you. Okay, over here on the left, see one hand, gentleman in blue shirt, right in the second to last row. Uh, hi, I'm Joshua Velezno. I'm a sophomore at Towson High School. And uh, my question for you is, there's hundreds of students being enrolled in our county every single year. And, uh, that's dealing, and that causes the op problem of overpopulation. And I was wondering, what are your methods and of solving that problem? And how long is those mes are those met methods going to take? So Baltimore County Public Schools, we're so fortunate. And we really do look at it as a fortunate that parents want to send their children to our school system. So when you talk about hundreds of students enrolling, we're projecting we have about 1,000 students every year. So if you kind of do the simple math and divide 1,000 by 10 or 12, you can kind of get a good estimate to you. Right, it is hundreds a month or 100 or so a month. So 1,000 every year projected forward. Well, that's a lot of parents and a lot of community members who want to be part of our school system, who want to have their children within our school system. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that at the elementary, the middle, and the high school level? So we have comprehensively an approach that looks at when a school is overcrowded, we work with our partners in the county government around where's the growth in the county? Where do we see growth? Where do we see capacity? Where do we see neighborhoods shifting from an older population who've raised their kids and raised their families who are now moving out and selling their homes to younger families, families who are just starting to have children, or where there's new development? So what our um, Department of Strategic Planning does is really work closely with our county government and our state government to not just do projections, but to say, well, when we have an area that's overcrowded or a school or a region or a set of schools in a particular part of the county that's overcrowded, what are some options for us? And we know there's kind of from the least expensive options to redistricting, as an example, to say, okay, here's a set of schools. That doesn't cost a lot of money, but there's a lot of emotional investment in moving kids from one school to another. So though that's a financial least expensive, there's a there's a connection to that. There's an emotional part of that. And we work our way all the way down to building a new school or adding an addition to actually physically adding or building new schools, which costs a lot of money. You're sitting in one. A beautiful example of where here we are in a community that was growing and is continuing to grow in the Dundalk area. And we had this beautiful example of one type of response to that. But there are others similar to redistricting, or other avenues that we use to alleviate some of that. So that is something that is continually being looked at, addressed in the budget, as we mentioned earlier in a couple of the other questions, long-term plans and short-term plans to look at how can we address more and more, as you said in your question, hundreds of kids coming, how are we gonna work through the thousand or more kids that come to our system every single year? Um, so that is an ongoing part, but that's a great um, question, particularly for some of the schools that you're coming, um, that you're representing. All right, we're going back over here. I'm going to go all the way in the back. Young lady, all the way in the back. Yeah. Good morning. My Good name morning. is Jalen Frazier. I am a freshman at Chesapeake High School. And my question to you today was, what if students become less motivated about high school 
and the amount of dropouts increases and the amount of graduates decreases, what would you do or want to do to solve that problem? That's a, ve that's a very good question. And it's something that we um, are constantly in conversation about, just really looking at um, the experience of our students within the high school setting and what are we doing to constantly engage you all as high school students to make sure that dropout is not an option. It kind of goes back to our conversation about um, while we know that there are things that you all need academically, we also know there's a social emotional learning side around instruction that we have to address. So what we're trying to do is really get at the core of what hap what's happening in each classroom, but then also think about what is it that our high schools are offering, as Mr. Roberts said, kind of like the, um, the gift with purchase, the additional resume. What are some of those things that are in our high schools that are really hooking you all as students, whether it's extracurricular activities, whether it's sports, um, the electives that are being offered, and then again, who is that adult that you're able to talk to before making a decision to drop out? So we're really working in a wraparound services kind of way to make sure that dropout is not an option. We've been able to maintain our graduation rate over the years um, of 89%, and that rate is continuing to increase because we are looking at student engagement and what is going to be done to motivate our students to just kind of finish this course or stay the course. So we're hoping that our schools are beginning to notice, again, the counselors um, that are in place, our college and career counselors that are working together with students that was added to our budget last year to be able to create some of the motivating factors um, within the school building. So I would like to continue that conversation with you personally for further maybe after to maybe discuss some specifics, but overall we are really looking at student engagement and high quality instruction as a lever to really hook students and then from there tapping into your entrance outside of being a student, but what are some of the things that you're interested in in terms of just globally or what's happening in the world so that school becomes a place where all of your needs are met, not just your instructional needs, but your social emotional needs as well. Thank you for that question. Okay, we'll come back up to the front here. Young lady right here, yep. Hi, I'm Hi. Tamira Ford from Parkville High School and I'm mm -hmm. a junior. My question is to you, um, at Parkville we have a Cal's Fall program for autistic students, mm -hmm. and my question is to you, what are you gonna do to provide more for them? Okay. So great question, and our, um, we work very closely with our staff and our Office of Special Education to look at how services are being provided to our students with special needs. And so there's, there's multiple things that go into that when we think about the supports that they need. There are their instructional supports, and so again, um, within our Division of Curriculum and Instruction, we look at the academic program that's being offered, but then we're also looking at other opportunities for them to engage in learning outside of the classroom. And so um, one way we look to support those students is we also look at ways that we're connecting them with their community. Um, so you may see sometimes uh, students in those programs leaving campus and going to learn outside of your campus, and that's intentional around connecting them to learning experiences within the community. That's the academic piece. We also look at how we're supporting them from a social emotional uh, lens as well. And so when we look at how we staff programs for our students with special needs, we're not just looking at our classroom teachers and our special education teachers, but we're also looking at um, what they might need in terms of guidance services, in terms of social work services so that we're addressing their social emotional needs as well as their academic needs. Um, we have seen an increase in our school system around students um, who have autism, and so our Office of Special Education works diligently in looking at the most current research in terms of how we can best support those students, and then our superintendent works through her budget process to make the requests for the people and the materials that are going to best support those students as well. So, great question. Okay, you so you're working diligently on those yeah. questions. So we're, we're <laughs> you're writing. anxious to see what you've written down. Here she comes. Hi, um, my name is Naila Wise, and I go to Eastern Technical High School, and I'm a sophomore. Um, so generally, the dress codes exclude things such as ripped jeans, crop tops, spaghetti straps, head wraps, etc. 
These rules, tar these rules especially target women due to sexuality and professionalism. I feel the rules are discriminatory towards women in certain cultures to try and prepare a student to try and prepare students for an older and more out of date work environment built also on discriminatory um, dress codes. So my question is, as the corporate jobs begin to adapt their dress codes to today's standards of clothing, such as head wraps or ripped jeans, sh should BCPS schools also adapt? Good question. That, that is a great question. That is right, Dr. Jones will that is, address that, one. <laughs> that is an excellent question. And um, um, I want to begin by saying that the, the policies and rules and um, guidelines that we have in place for dress clothes are not in place to um, be offensive um, and or um, in any way um, create any, I guess, feelings around discrimination. So we want to kind of start by that. What I will say is that it is very important that we continue to view our, review our policies and rules as we continue to serve and service a um, diverse student population. So some of the things that you mentioned are um, garments that relate to kind of the cultural experiences of our students, and then there's some other garments that we wear because of, because of choice. Um, we have heard this before where sometimes there are um, some young ladies who feel like the dress code and the policies are very restrictive or kind of leaning one way versus the other. And so what I will share with you is that when you all continue to bring this to our attention, we go back and we have conversations about our policies. There are policy review committees that actually um, look at the policies around dress code and, and what is acceptable dress. Dress code policies um, are in place because what we don't want to do is distract from the learning environment. But we also don't want to restrict or confine you know, individual expression, especially as it relates to culture and, and race and ethnicity. So it's a delicate balance, and it's a balance that we're always trying to kind of make sure that we are maintaining. But the conversation continues. And as you say, in the, in the, in the workforce, and what is considered kind of um, job-ready clothing and or um, you know, clothes that that's people can wear now, it is changing. So we have to change as well. We just, because it's changing so fast, we're not able to necessarily keep up with it. But the conversation is being centered around how can we have a dress code policy that allows for self-expression, but also provides for minimal distractions within the school environment. And one of the things that Ms. White um, has done and continues to do is have um, our students represented in panels and discussions around that, because policies like that should be shaped and informed by our students. And so she's always in conversations around what it is that you all want and need to see. And then within the confines of the um, policies and rules, we'll be able to shape that. So we are looking at that policy. It continues to come up around how can we meet the needs of our ever-changing diverse population. But thank you for continuing to bring that to our attention. Right over here in the, I'll take right here in the jean jacket. Hi, I'm Emily Fishball from Perry Hall High School. Really? Um, going back to how you were saying that you wanted students to have their opinion in the board of dress codes, also that there are many schools with lower funding than others towards integrating students into the student board or their opinions into the board of education and how you would like help the funding and to get those students more like heard. Yeah. So, so <laughs> Emily, that, that's great. We're, we're kind of arguing who's going to take that one. That's a great question. Um, so student voice, if you remember, I opened with there's nothing more important to our superintendent than your voice and student voice. Dr. Jones just referenced a superintendent has a student advisory panel that she meets with on a regular basis, and it's just students who are around her conference table who share with her, very similar to this. It really is just a, a question and answer. She shares some remarks, and then it's a conversation. But let's talk about some of the other ways to get to Emily's question. When we talk about a school, your voice, as critical as it is to the superintendent, it's just as critical to teachers that you are heard by teachers, by principals, by assistant principals, by staff within your buildings. Now, how do you go about doing that? That could be something as formal as a student council, where you become a member of your student government association and you, in a formal way, really have your voices heard in a, in a structured student government association way. 
It could be a principal's advisory panel. And many of our principals across in your schools have student advisory panels that meet with the principal on a monthly basis or on a regular basis. But what are some of the other informal ways? It could be a note, an email. So Emily, if something's on your mind at Perry Hall High School and you're going, you know what, I, either I, I want to make sure my principal hears this, but I'm not a member of the student government or I don't want to go through one of those formal ways, then maybe it's an email to the principal. It's a note that you say, hey, can you, someone leave this on the principal's desk and then they can reach out and talk to you one-on-one -on -one or in private or in a small group, depending on what the issue is. Talk about dress code. So maybe if, as, a, as, as a group you wanna talk about dress code, then that's an informal way in their formal way. So then when we go out of a school, then we look at the Baltimore County Student Council, the BCSC, which is a representative body of all the student government associations across the school system um, in middle and high school. That's another way to have your voice heard. Certainly the most formal way, and you mentioned it a little bit, Emily, in your question, was a student member of the board. Um, Omar Rashid was just elected, our student member of the board for the 2019-2020 school year. So he is that one voice that sits on the Board of Education that represents and speaks for 114,000 students. So what does that mean to you? if you're one of the, you are one of the 114,000 students. It means you send, and if you listen to Omar's speech um, uh, last week um, before the election, he talked about really leveraging social media. And I'm not gonna list all the social media places, that, but you can find him. And he made it very clear to the students um, in that auditorium at Milford Mill, that is one of the ways he's going to leverage and utilize to get your voice. Because when he's sitting on that dais with the other adults, he is very well aware that he represents your voice. So use the social media apps that he's on um, and ask him questions. Send him comments. Send him emails. Because at that point, he will come out to schools. He certainly has made it very clear he's going to come out to schools. He wants to hear from you about what's happening. So hopefully in this answer, Emily, we've addressed kind of some of the informal ways you can go about gathering input, some of the more formal ways you can um, provide your input, but never ever think that your voice is not important. It is the most important voice in the entire school system. So with that, thank you for that question and certainly make sure you, you, you take advantage of that. All right, I think we're going to stick in the middle here. This gentleman in the white and the green tie. Oh, he's right here. Yeah, just stand up and they'll see you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Rose Senior at Oakley High School. Okay. Um, going back to the questions about class sizes and population, class sizes. when the student-teacher ratios are released to the public, is that classroom teachers of record or the number of people who work within the building, including members of the Office of School Counseling, paraeducators, and people with titles who do not actually teach classes, for example, building service workers and secretarial staff? Great question. Thank you. Your staffing is reported a few ways. Um, it is reported through a classroom student teacher ratio. So that would be specifically classroom teachers per student. Um, but there is a staff to student ratio and that doesn't, that is inclusive of the entire staff. So it could be staff without um, direct teaching loads is what you guys would say, right? So your counselors, your social workers, your psychologists. Um, it's so you, there's both. And when we look at how we're balancing that, um, to what Dr. Jones said earlier, there's so many factors that weigh into that because it's really driven by your requests as students. So as we see needs around what types of programs, what type of types of courses you both need to take, right? So you have your graduation requirements that you need to be fulfilled, but then there are also courses that you want to take. Um, we have to look at the balance of those requests and then determine what is the best way to, from an instructional standpoint, staff, staff your school. Um, but in terms of ancillary staff members, so getting back to those counselors, social workers, psychologists, we do look at your overall enrollment as a school and we use ratios per enrollment to determine the number of staff members that are allocated to an individual school based on that enrollment. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight into how we go about determining those formulas, but then also reporting them as well. 
Thank you. Great question. Great questions, guys. You guys are really getting deep. Yeah. Let's go back to the very back. The young lady, you just raised your hand in the last second there. There you go. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sakina. I'm a junior at Patapsco High School. Wonderful. Welcome. My question is, I was BCPS promoting diversity in schools and mm -hmm. also making a safe space for people of different cultures, races, gender, and mm -hmm. LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Sakina. Thank you for your question. Um, BCPS values diversity, and we value diversity so much that we actually have an Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. And so one of the things that we are doing and what we've done this year to really kind of ramp that up and make that more, um, create more awareness around that is we're working with um, principals within um, our feeder patterns. So we have feeder patterns which are K through 12, and um, I think you said your school was Patapsco. And so we're working with the schools, the elementary schools that feed into Patapsco and the principals to really have conversations about equitable practices and equitable outcomes for all students. So we're no, we're no longer just looking at um, aggregate and or um, a, a group of students or one group of students. We're now breaking down those groups into what you just said, into diverse student populations to be able to see how are we meeting the needs of all of our students? How are we meeting the needs of every student? How is every student being valued within their school community, whether they are few or whether they are, are many? So um, equity is one of our um, core values and um, core principles just around the work. And what that means is that we just want every student to get exactly what they need from the learning experience. And so again, diversity is something that we have decided to make a part of our daily work. We wanna make sure that all of our students are represented in athletics, extracurricular, non-curricular activities, and we want to make sure you have a voice. Um, in Patapsco specifically, I know the principal and the work that's going on there is really around thinking about multiple pathways for all students because there's no one pathway. And so how can we diversify our options to meet the needs of our diverse population? So we're constantly going in and out of that and having conversations and creating awareness so that you and all of our students within our county feel appreciated and valued. Opportunity and access is something that we want for all students. Thank you so much for your question. All right, let's come back up in the front. This young lady right here in the corner. Wait, wait for the mic. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll work our way back. Hi, my name is Sydney. I'm a freshman at Eastern Tech. My question is, with mental health issues and disorders growing among students and other young people, how can we do a better job of incorporating mental health information and awareness into schools? We have counselors and other people, but I feel like they're not enough because obviously the data shows that they're increasing. So what else can we do to better inform and aware our students of mental health issues? A timely question. Yeah, tag team it. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we, can, we can kind of um, break that question apart a little bit, but as you mentioned, we do have counselors, we do have social workers who are in place, and we're trying to get more of those specialized services into our schools to address the growing need of mental health issues. Um, some of our schools are really at points where, as you said, um, we have to do more. And so engaging our parents and engaging our communities and engaging our partners around how can we address the um, mental health issues that are happening in our schools is another way that we can kind of involve more stakeholders into the conversation. Um, some of our schools are hosting um, family nights and or community events that allow for those conversations that no one really wants to talk about to kind of happen in those safe in those safe spaces. So you have your counselors, you have your social workers, as we said before, we have PPWs and psychologists, but our schools are now engaging some of our health professionals and some of our community partners in the conversation. So whenever you see kind of flyers go out around needing additional support, um, around mental health issues or things like that, it is very important that we engage our families in that, conversa in that conversation so that we can better address some of the stressful things that are really happening, happening in our schools. And we understand nowadays that things are more stressful than they used to be. And we want to, again, be more proactive than reactive. So our community engagement with our partners is very important to us and our superintendent. Anyone else want to add to that? No, you hit it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's go, uh, let's start back up at the front here and then we'll get back to the back and then we'll kind of go back that way. Hello, I'm Madame from Kenwood High School. I'm a junior. Good morning. Um, my question was about the budget and how Ms. Rosita White is gonna share like the money between all the different schools and how she determines which school gets more money and which mo school gets less money. Right, so again, it, it, it's, it's not less or more, 
Um, it's a matter of, let's kind of back up a little bit, because that's a very, very good question. It ties in with some of the other budget questions. The superintendent builds her budget based on input from the community. So the superintendent doesn't sit by herself in a room and just kind of to what you're saying, just kind of just say, well, I'm going to give this much here and this much here. It is the absolute opposite of that. She, the budget actually for next year, she's already been thinking about that. So as we mentioned, the county executive presented um, his budget. Now it goes to the county council. Well, what Mrs. White is doing is already thinking about what is going to be in her budget that goes to the Board of Education in December of this year. So how does she do that? She gathers input from the community. She gathers input from you. So she's going to be watching this and listening to probably about four or five budget questions. <laughs> we had some technology questions. We have this budget question. So she's going to watch this and she's going to get your input. She has her student advisory panel, but she also utilizes parent and adult stakeholder groups. She gathers input from um, teachers, she gathers input from other support staff, she gathers input from administrators, from principals and assistant principals and central office staff, she gathers input from our partners in county government, from everyone, and then based on the assessment of needs, you asked about mental health, we talked a lot today about mental health and supports, so she takes all of this information, remember I was talking about literacy at the beginning, and taking all this complex information, well what she does is she takes all this information and with her team she then starts prioritizing and not prioritizing as much as x school gets this and x school gets that that's that's a separate process but around what are the priorities so we talked about literacy and climate so she's going to start there and what are we going to do to support literacy and a literacy initiative so she engages in conversations with her team in curriculum and instruction and around instruction around how are we going to support there then she engages staff in the office and division of school climate and safety and other stakeholders. So all of that comes together in a budget that is presented to the Board of Education. And then in that are all the specifics that I think we were addressing in the Towson High question are all the specifics of well, how are we going to get that done and who's going to get that done. And that's kind of where you see the prioritization of funds going um, from one department or one office to another. So I've gotten the, and I know we have about six or seven questions left. Um, so we've gotten the wrap-up signal here because time flies um, and this is great. I want to and we want to, um, again on behalf of our superintendent Verlita White, thank you all for taking time out of your day. We know it's hard when you come out of school, some of you are going, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm out of it, but you got to make up that work. Um, you got to go back and that and that's something where, you know, that, that's an added stress. You got to go back and you got to make up work. So we want to thank you for being willing to represent your school. Because make no mistake, you are the voice that's representing your school. So for each of you who had a chance to ask a question, and for each of you that maybe didn't get a chance, as I said, we'll stay behind. Um, you certainly can email us, and we can come out and talk to you more in depth. So again, on behalf of our superintendent, on behalf of our cabinet, and, and of the teachers and staff who brought you here today, we want to thank all of you for coming out today, and have a great year. Thank you.